All right, so uh, what I will tell you today is a little bit about my, about my research uh, using powerful microscopic techniques to look at atoms, and not only to look at them, but also to, to do, th do things with them. Um, so to really get in touch with atoms and molecules. All right, uh, here's a picture of Richard Feynman, who was uh, one of the more famous physicists of the previous century. And apart from being a famous physicist, he was also very good at other things like playing bongo drums or, or picking locks or other things like this uh, useful outside the academic set. And in one interview, he was asked uh, that if you had to condense all human knowledge into a single sentence, what would that sentence be? Feynman thought about it for a while and he replied that I would say that uh, everything is made of atoms. All right. Everything is made of, made of atoms, including the earth and a cup of, good cup of coffee. Uh, now, atoms are, of course, too small to be seen by the naked eye, so we don't see the atoms of the, the coffee atoms or the cup atoms. Uh, but there are microscopic techniques to, to look at these atoms in, in real space. To get an idea on how small the atoms really are, I have a silly comparison for you. So the diameter of the Earth is about 13,000 kilometers. The diameter of a good cup of coffee, at least a good cup of espresso coffee, is about 5 centimeters. So the ratio between these two is about 300 million. Now if we go again down in scale from the cup of coffee, another factor of 300 million, we end up on the, the scale of atoms. The scale of sub-nanometer, nanometer is the billionth of a meter, and, and a tenth of a billionth of a meter is called angstrom, and that's uh, where the atoms lie. So here's a, here's a scanning probe microscopy image of a surface with individual gold atoms. So each blob here is, is a single gold atom. And, and let's see what we can, uh, how do these techniques work and, and what can we do with, with them. All right, so what, do, what would we like to have? So I'm an experimentalist. What kind of techniques would we, we like to have? at our disposal. So first of all, we'd like to be able to see the geometry of a surface of, of an object, the thing we are studying. Oops, sorry. So we'd like to know where are the atoms. We'd like to know which atoms they are, so to do some sort of elemental mapping. Then this is not enough. We also like to know uh, how do the mechanical and electronic properties uh, vary on the atomic scale. So for example, if we want to add electrons to a material, we'd like to know where they go. Uh, this has to do with, you know, atoms are simpler than this remote pointer. So if we want to add or remove electrons, we'd like to know where they, do they go to. This tells us about the reactivity of a surface. Uh, then also, if we have a molecule and we add a signal electron, this will generate some sort of a charge distribution that is directly related to chemical reactivity. So we'd like to be able to, to look at this as well. And, and then, in the end, it would also be nice to, to, to be able to change molecules or small pieces of matter, one atom at a time, and see how the properties change when you do this. All right, I will show you that, that, uh, that we can do something along these lines in reality. And, and then what we can do with that, we can do single molecule chemistry and physics. And we can also look at things like uh, how do the properties change when we go from a single atom to, to bulk matter? So, of course, for example, if you take a piece of gold, a bulk piece of gold has very different properties from a single gold atom. And somewhere in between, uh, the, the properties evolve from, from the single atom to the bulk. And, and we'd like to be able to look at this kind of things. All right, so, so the technique, uh, or the, the family of techniques to do this kind of experiments is called the scanning probe microscopes. There are two prominent members of this family is the scanning tunneling microscope and the atomic force microscope. And I will explain to you in a second how they work. They were invented by these two gentlemen here, Gerhard Binich and Heinrich Rohr in the 80s in the IBM Zurich Research Lab, and they got the Nobel Prize in Physics for this in 1985. Okay, so they, they all work on the same principle. So you know that uh, optical microscopy is not powerful enough to see atoms. This is a family of microscopes that works in a different way. So what we have is a probe that, so, uh, how to say, a sharp probe that terminates in a tip. The sharp on the atomic scale, so it means that the, the end of the, the probe should be only a few atoms in size. And we bring it close to a sample surface we want to in investigate. Close is again on the atomic scale close, so at the distance of a few atomic diameters. There has to be some interaction. This can be the tunneling current in the case of the scanning tunneling microscope, so really electrical current that we can measure. It can be the force 
in the case of the atomic force microscope. So we can measure this interaction and then this, this probe tip is mounted on a scanner that can move it in x, y and z directions. Then we have some sort of a feedback mechanism that moves the tip up and down as we raster it over the sample surface so that this interaction is kept constant. So when we do this, we will get some sort of a, a, a topography map of the sample surface. And it turns out that, that we can do this with extremely high spatial resolution. For example, here is this, an image of a single organometallic complex uh, acquired with the STM, scanning tunnel microscope. Now, we can do more than this. We can also then find some interesting po point in this molecule, fix the tip there, change some external bias, such as the, the bias voltage, and measure how this interaction varies. So for example, if we measure the, the current as a function of the bias voltage, we can tell, we get some sort of spectrum that will tell us about the electronic properties of the sample at the position determined by the tip. So we can, we can do electronic spectroscopy with atomic spatial resolution. All right, so as I already said, I'm an experimentalist. And um, uh, so when I go to the lab, this is how the STM looks like. Uh, or in fact, what you see here is a ultra high vacuum chamber. Uh, so the pressure inside the chamber is about 13 orders of magnitude lower than outside. And we have to do this, we want to look at individual atoms and molecules. So the surfaces have to be very, very clean. So this means that we have to work in ultra high vacuum. Uh, then the second thing is that, especially these spectroscopic experiments, they take some time. So we have to be able to position the tip on top of the atom or the molecule we want to look at for quite some time. So we need very high mechanical stability. And, and for this, we typically work at low temperatures. So this canister here on top is a, is a helium cryostat. And the STM that is located inside the vacuum chamber in the cryostat is at a temperature of 5 Kelvin, so 5 degrees above absolute zero. And this kind of arrangement gives us the sufficient mechanical stability to do the, to the experiments. The cost of a research instrument like this is about half a million euro. This is, uh, let's say that the experimental physics in this, at, at this uh, direction is, is relatively expensive, but this is the kind of investment you have to be willing to make to, to do this kind of experiment. All right, so now what I will do is I will give you three examples on, on what kind of things can you do with, the, with this, um, these microscopes. So we can look at where the atoms are. We can look at uh, reactivity or chemistry, in single molecule scale. And then I will finish off with some, uh, some, some things on graphene nanoelectronics and what can scanning probes do there. All right, so here, here's a friend of mine. He's called pentacene. It's a, a molecule where you have these five fused carbon rings. Uh, connected together and then some hydrogens on the outside. And now if we put this in an atomic force microscope and do everything correctly, then what we can see is a picture like this. So you can really see in the microscopic image all the, the carbon rings and even the carbon hydrogen bonds here on the side. So we can look at molecules with atomic space resolution. All right, so what, what can we what can we do with this? After some time, sometime after we published the, the paper on the pentacene, uh, some marine biologists approached my colleagues in, in IBM Zurich and they, they said that, listen, we have this problem. There's this, this bacterium that lives at the bottom of the ocean and it, it produces some, some, some uh, metabolites and one of them, we can't tell how it looks like. We have this molecule that, that uh, based on the analysis we do, can have one of the four different possible structures, but we can't tell which one it is. So we saw your paper, can you put it on a surface and look at it with AFM? And my colleagues did exactly this. So here is an AFM image of this, this molecule. And when you overlay this, this is the correct structural formula for this molecule. So they could, based on these AFM images, they could tell which one of the possible structures is the correct one. So you can do single molecule structural analysis with the AFM. This is of course pretty, pretty nice. Um, there are two things I want to point out to you, these are kind of things that we are now working on. Is First of all, if you look carefully in the AFM image, you can see that the different atoms are different. So here we have some carbon, the, the blue guys are nitrogens, the red ones are oxygens, and they all look a little bit different in the AFM image. So it looks like that it would be possible to get elemental contrast uh, in the AFM images. So this, is, uh, this would be a very nice thing, and this is, we are working on this. Another thing is that uh, when you look at this molecule, you can see that it's a flat one. So all the atoms are on a single plane, and this is relatively easy to look at with the AFM tip. Uh, of course, in reality, most molecules are, have complicated three-dimensional shapes, 
and it's not at all at the moment clear whether we can say something about the internal structure by doing AFM imaging. Because what the AFM, what you do is you look at the surface of the molecule. So whether it's possible to do some sort of 3D imaging or topography with the AFM, we don't know, but uh, we'd like to find out. Okay. Then a short piece on, on, on chemistry. So um, how could you do chemistry in an STM or AFM? Well, the idea is the following. We will put the molecules that we like on the surface. These will be the reactants for the chemical reaction. And then we will use the STM tip. Uh, you can not only take pictures and spectra with the tip, but you can also push and pull things on the surface. So we can use the STM tip to manipulate these atoms and molecules to form finally the product we like, and then look at its properties with the, with the STM, to study its chemical reactivity on the single molecule. So this is how it looks like in, in practice. Here we have a surface. The, the bright blobs here, there are four of them. They are iron, individual iron atoms. The oval-shaped guys are, are dicyan anthracene molecules. And we know that these are them because this is what we put on the surface first. And now what we will do is we will zoom in here in the middle and, and, and then do some pushing and pulling with the STM tip. So we will first move this iron atom a little bit. Up. Then we will push it a little bit more. And then, in fact, very difficult to see here, but it has now been bound with this, this uh, organic molecule. Then we will push this other organic molecule, make it up. Well, now we are almost there. A fun, final nudge on this guy, and we've made a, a sort of a linear complex that we wanted to. So where we have a single iron atom in the middle, and then two of these organic ligands on the sides. So you can make molecules, one molecule at a time, uh, with the STM. And now we'll what we can do is, for example, we can, we can ask the question, what happens if we want to uh, remove electrons? So if we want to oxidize this molecule, where would it happen? So we can do spectroscopic measurements, and base, based on them, we can draw such a map. So this is the areas in the molecule where the elect first electron like to re would like to leave from. So this is locally where the oxidation would most likely proceed. Okay, we can also ask about reduction, so adding electrons. It looks very similar. So this is a similar molecular orbital that's involved in both. Then if we want to add a second electron, it turns out that this is very different. This would like to go to the metal center in the middle of the molecule. So we can re really learn about chemistry at the single molecule level based on this kind of experiments. All right, now to finish off with, uh, we also have some interest in, in graphene. Graphene, of course, is a single sheet of carbon atoms. Here's a schematic picture of, of it. This won the Physics Nobel Prize last year. So why did it get the Nobel Prize? Well, it's a material that is a single atom thick. This is, of course, pretty cool. And that should not be underestimated in terms of why it got the Nobel Prize. It also has some very exceptional mechanical and electronic properties. And then there are many potential uses for graphene, and we are interested in one of them. And this is to make nanoelectronics. So people have proposed that, that let's assume that you can do the following thing. Let's assume that we can somehow define directly on graphene electrodes. So here we would make source, drain, gate, some sort of an island in the middle. Then cut out the, the, the extra parts with an unspecified technique. Uh, then what we would left, be left with is a, is a transistor uh, entirely made out of graphene. Okay, this is a very nice idea. Uh, at the moment, there are no tools that allow uh, manufacturing these atomically precise structures of graphene. And this is what we are, we are looking into, we and many others, in fact. And, and there's one thing I'd like to point out to you is that here I've drawn two very similar structures. You can see that the size of the island is, is the same in both, but the orientation of the carbon sheet is different. And it turns out that when you go down to the atomic scale, it's predicted that these two uh, structures would have different properties. So if you want to make a transistor that is this, this small, you really have to control exactly where every atom is. All right, this is a problem, but it's also a possibility in the sense that, that if you can do this, then you can make components, electronic components that, that don't have any analog in the silicon technology. And that's one of the so-called final goals of nanoelectronics is to be able to make something that you can't make out of silicon. So this would be a, the, this would be a proposal of, of one such thing. All right. Um, now, as a final example, what I will now focus on is the central islands here. So we have not made a graphene device like this. 
nobody has made with this precision. What we will focus now is in the, on the electronic properties of a small piece of graphene that could form the central island of, of such a structure. So these can be grown. Uh, us, us and others have found out that you can grow these small, very well-defined pieces of graphene. Here's an STM image of one of them. You can see the hexagons here on the edges, not so well on the, on the middle, but if you zoom in, the atoms are there. And you can then extract the position of all the atoms, and then this would be then the schematic of, how to say, atom position map from the STM image. Then we can look at the electronic structure. So this is for, for the, how to say, technically inclined people, this is the local density of states at different energies. So this tells us where the electrons are at different energies. And, and we can, of course, also uh, check uh, how this works by comparison with theory. And there's one aspect here is that what is nice is that we can compare theory and experiment for exactly the same atomic structure. It's not always so clear in the experiment what is the structure, but with the STM we can, we can look at that with high precision as well. And then we can do things like uh, how do the properties evolve when the size of the island is changed. So here we have a random collection of different sizes of graphene islands. And then here are, we measure the energy of the ground, ground state, and you can see how it varies with, with the area. All right. Okay, I think with that I would like to conclude. So first of all, rest assured, everything is indeed made out of atoms, and we can, and we can, we can see them. Okay, then we can look, look at things like single molecule chemistry. Uh, look at where locally the electron addition or removal would take place. We can also make molecules. And finally, we can study uh, small structures with atomic resolution and also to learn about the electronic properties. And, and before thanking you for your attention, I'd like to mention that this kind of uh, research is, is typically a collaborative effort. So, so the results that I've shown you are, have been done together with several labs over the Europe, There's IBM Zurich, Regensburg, Utrecht, and then also different groups from ALDA that have all contributed. And uh, we have been funded by many, many, many uh, institutions. And now, thank you for your attention.